Chapter One Hundred Three of the Wild Huntress. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Main Reed. Chapter One Hundred Three seeking a catch we rode direct for robideau's pass the night still continued dark but we had no difficulty in finding our way even in the obscurity the deep trace of the heavy emigrant train was sufficiently conspicuous and we were enabled to follow the back track with precision our experienced guide could have conducted us over it in blindfold that we were pursued and hotly pursued there could be little doubt for my part i felt certain of it the stake which stebbins had hitherto held was too precious to be parted with on slight conditions the jealous vigilance with which lillian had been guarded along the route amounting as i had incidentally ascertained to a positive espionage her yellow duenna at once acting as spy and protectress all were significant of the intent already suspected by us but of which the young girl herself was perhaps happily ignorant the failure of his design and now for the second time would be a rude contretemps for the pseudo apostle and would no doubt endanger his expected promotion besides he must have believed or suspected that marian holt still lived that she had survived the exposure consequent on her escape from the first caravan and this belief or suspicion would now be confirmed by the reappearance of the dog nay it was almost certain that on recognizing the animal the truth had suddenly flashed upon him that marian was herself upon the ground and that the spotted countenance that had for the moment deceived him was that of his tennessean bride the abduction followed upon the instant would not only confirm his belief but would redouble his eagerness in a pursuit that promised a recapture of both the victims who had thus unexpectedly escaped from his control though with different motives it was natural that holt himself should be equally eager to pursue he might still know nothing about the presence of marian or her disguise to him it would simply appear that his other child had been stolen from the camp carried off by indians and that should be sufficient to rouse him to the most strenuous efforts for her recovery for these reasons we had no doubt about our being pursued and with all the zeal and energy of which our apostolic enemy and his myrmidons were capable of putting forth twenty miles separated the mormon camp from the entrance to robideau's pass nearly the whole of that distance was traversed in a gallop so far we had experienced no apprehension but after entering the pass our foaming horses began to show signs of fatigue those of shoreshot and wingrove that were weaker than the rest manifested symptoms of giving out both were evidently broken and without rest could go no further this produced a new uneasiness we presumed that the horses of our pursuers would be comparatively fresh after their long encampment while ours had not only made a considerable journey the day before but on that same day had passed over fifty miles of ground twenty of it in a gallop 
no wonder they were manifesting signs of distress shortly after entering the pass we drew up to deliberate by continuing onward we should be almost certain to be overtaken this was the more probable from the keen pursuit we had reason to anticipate to remain where we were would be to await the coming up of the enemy no doubt in such numbers as to render our capture secure and any attempt to defend ourselves would be idle as fatal it was no longer with indians we should have to deal no longer with lances and arrows but with strong bold men armed like ourselves and far outnumbering us to conceal ourselves within the gorge and permit our pursuers to pass might have served our purpose for the time had there been sufficient cover but neither the rocks nor the trees offered an advantageous hiding-place for our horses the risk of their being discovered appeared too great we dared not trust to such a slight chance of security within the pass it was not possible to part from the trail and on discovering the condition of our horses we regretted not having left it before entering we even entertained the question of returning some distance since we might leave the trail by ascending a spur of the mountains in our rear but this course appeared too perilous perhaps at that moment our pursuers might be entering the pass perhaps at that moment adown the glen rode armed men though as yet our ears were not assailed by the sound of their trampling fortunately in this moment of hesitancy a thought occurred to our mexican comrade that promised to release us from the dilemma it was a memory that had suddenly flashed upon him he remembered on one of his trapping expeditions having discovered a ravine that led out of robodo's pass on the northern side it was a mere cleft cliff just wide enough to admit the body of a man on horseback but further up it opened into a little plain or vallon as the mexican termed it completely girt in by mountains these on all sides rose precipitously from the plain as to render it impossible for a mounted man to scale them the trapper had himself been obliged to return by the gorge after having vainly endeavored to find a way leading outward above the vallon was therefore a cul-de-sac or as the trapper in his native synonym called it a bolson our guide was of opinion that this bolson would serve as a hiding place until we could rest our horses he was confident that the entrance of the ravine was not far from where we had halted and moreover that he should be able to find it without difficulty his advice therefore was that we should seek the gorge and having found it ride up into the vallon and there remain till the following night the pursuit might pass in the meantime and return again but whether or not our animals would then be rested and even should we again encounter the pursuers we might hope to escape through the superior speed of our horses the plan was feasible there was but one objection that struck me and i offered it for the consideration of our guide the vallon as he had stated was a cul-de-sac should we be tracked into it there would be no chance of retreat we should be taken as in a trap carumbo exclaimed the mexican in answer to my suggestion no fear of being tracked by such curs as they they know nothing of that business not one of their whole fraternity could follow the trace of a buffalo in snow time carumbo no 
there is one who could i replied one who could follow a feebler trail than ours what a restrador among the judios who caviero their father i whispered the reply so that neither of the girls could overhear it oh true muttered the mexican the father of the huntress a hunter himself carai that's like enough but no matter i can take you up the gorge in such fashion that the most skilled rastreador of the prairies would never suspect we had passed through fortunately the ground is favorable the bottom of the little canyon is covered with cut rocks the hoof will leave no mark upon these remember that some of our horses are shod the iron will betray us no senor we shall muffle them nos vamos con los pies en medias let us travel in stockings the idea was not new to me and without further hesitation we proceeded to carry it into execution with pieces of blanket and strips cut from our buckskin garments we muffled the hoofs of our shod horses and after following the wagon trail till we found a proper place for parting from it we diverged in an oblique direction towards the bluff that formed the northern boundary of the pass along this bluff we followed the guide in silence and after going for a quarter of a mile further we had the satisfaction to see him turn to the left and suddenly disappear from our sight as if he had ridden into the face of the solid rock we might have felt astonishment but a dark chasm at the same instant came under our eyes and we knew it was the ravine of which our guide had spoken without exchanging a word we turned our horses heads and rode up into the cleft there was water running among the shingle over which our steeds trampled but it was shallow and did not hinder their advance it would further aid in concealing their tracks should our pursuers succeed in tracing us from the main route but we had little apprehension of their doing this so carefully had we concealed our trail on separating from that of the wagons on reaching the little vallon we no longer thought of danger but riding on to its upper end dismounted and made the best arrangements that circumstances would admit of for passing the remainder of the night wrapped in buffalo roads and a little apart from the rest of our party the sisters reclined side by side under the canopy of a cottonwood tree long while had it been since these beautiful forms had reposed so near each other and the soft low murmur of their voices heard above the sighing of the breeze and the rippling sound of the mountain rills admonished us that each was confiding to the other the sweet secret of her bosom end of chapter one hundred three chapter one hundred four of the wild huntress this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by shasta oakland california the wild huntress by thomas main reed chapter one hundred four un paraiso we come to the closing act of our drama to understand it fully it is necessary that the setting of the stage the misse and scene be described with a certain degree of minuteness the little valley plain or vallon in which we had catched ourselves 
was not over 300 yards in length and of an elliptical form but for this form it might have resembled some ancient crater scooped out of the mountain that on all sides swept upward around it the sides of this mountain trending up from the level of the plain rose not with a gentle acclivity but with precipitous abruptness at no point however did it assume the character of a cliff it might have been scaled with difficulty by a man on foot especially should he avail himself of the assistance of the trees pines and trailing junipers that grew over the steep so thickly as to conceal the greater portion of its rocky facade here and there only a bare spot might be observed a little buttress of white laminated gypsum mingled with sparking selenite while at other places a miniature torrent leaping over the rocks and dancing among the dark cedars presented a very similar appearance these little torrents splashing down to the plain formed numerous crystal rills that traversed the vallon like the branches of a silver candelabrum all united near its centre and there formed a pellucid stream that sweeping onward discharged itself through the ravine into ribadeau's pass the effect of this abundance of water had been to produce within the vallon a proportionate luxuriance of vegetation though it had not assumed the form of a forest a few handsome cottonwoods standing thinly over it were the only trees but the surface exhibited a verdure of emerald brightness enameled by many a gay corolla born to blush unseen within this sweet secluded glen along the edge of the rivulet large water plants projected their broad leaves languidly over the stream and where the little cascades came down from the rocks the flowers of beautiful orchids and other rare epiphytes were seen sparkling under the spray many of them clinging to the coniferae and thus uniting almost the extreme types of the botanical world such lovely landscape was presented to our eyes in the bolson into which our trapper guide had conducted us it appeared lovely as we first beheld it under the blue light of dawn but lovelier far when the sun began to tinge the summits of the mojada mountains that encircled it and scatter his empurpled roses on the snowy peaks of the Huatoya, just visible through the gorge esta un paraiso it is paradise exclaimed the mexican warming with the poetry of his race and verdad un paraiso even better peopled than the paradise of old mira cavalleros continued he behold not one eve but two each i dare say as beautiful as the mother of mankind as the trapper spoke he pointed to the young girls who hand in hand were returning from the stream where they had been performing their ablutions the spots of allegria had disappeared from the cheeks of marian that now gleamed in all their crimson picturesqueness it was for wingrove to admire these my own eyes were riveted upon the roseate blonde and gazing upon her face i could not help echoing the sentiment of the enthusiastic speaker beautiful as the mother of mankind wingrove and i had been to the laboratory before them and had succeeded to a certain extent 
in scouring our skins clear of the vermilion bedaubment in the anticipation of this pleasant interview it was natural we should seek to rescue ourselves from a disguise that the eye of woman would not look upon otherwise than with dejo it was natural too that we should desire those clasped hands to come asunder those maiden forms to be separated from one another fortune was pleased to respond to our wishes a flower hanging from the branch of a tree at that moment caught the eye of lilian and dropping her sister's hand she hastened to gather it marian who cared less for flowers did not follow her perhaps her inclination tempted her the other way but one did follow the fair lilian unable to resist the opportunity for free converse the only one that had offered since that first sweet interview how my heart bounded when i beheld the blossom of the begonia for it was that which hung drooping from the branch of the cottonwood round which its bright leaves were amorously entwining how it swelled with a triumphant joy when i saw those tiny fingers extend toward the sour gently pluck it from its stem and place it upon my bosom talk not of bliss if it not be this we strayed on through the straggling trees along the banks of the stream by the edges of the little rills we wandered around the vallon and stood by the torrents that fell foaming from the rocks we mingled our voices with the waters that in low murmurings appeared to repeat the sentiment so endeared to us i think of thee and you will lilian you will always thus think of me yes edward for ever and ever was the kiss unhallowed that could seal such a promise no it was sacred down to earth's profound and up to heaven thus benighted with the sweet hallucination of love how could we dream that on earth there existed an alloy how suspect that into that smiling garden the dread serpent could ever intrude himself alas he was at that moment approaching it he was already near the place we had chosen for our temporary bivouac and where we had passed the night was at the upper extremity of the little valley and close in to the cliff we had selected this spot from the ground being a little more elevated than the general surface and in consequence drier several cottonwood trees shaded it and it was further sheltered by a number of large boulders of rock that having fallen from the cliff above lee lay near its base behind these boulders the men of our party had slept not from any idea of the greater security afforded by them but simply from a delicate motive being thus separated from the chamber occupied by our fair proteges it had never occurred to us that our place of concealment could be discovered in the night and even long after the day had risen so confident did we continue in our fancied security that we had taken no precautions neither to reconnoitre the cliffs in search of a way of retreat nor to adopt any means of defence in the event of our being assailed as far as wingrove and i were concerned i have explained this negligence for it was negligence of the most imprudent character the mexican feeling quite certain that he had succeeded in blinding our trail was perhaps less cautious than he might otherwise have been and sure shot equally trusted 
to his new comrade for whose still the ex-ranger had conceived an exalted opinion i could see withal that archilete was not without some apprehension he had buckled on his artificial leg the real one having become fatigued by pressing too long on the stirrup and as he hobbled over the ground i noticed that from time to time he cast inquiring glances down the valley observing these signs of impatience more than once i began to grow uneasy prudence required that even that sweet scene should be interrupted only temporality i hoped until some plan should be adopted that would render us more secure against the contingency of our being discovered with my fair companion i had turned away from the sweet whisperings of the cascade and was facing to the upper end of the vallum when all at once i observed a strange manoeuvre on the part of peg leg the trapper had thrown himself flat upon the grass and with his ear placed close to the ground appeared to listen the movement was too significant not to attract the attention of everybody my companion was the only one who did not comprehend it but she observed that it had powerfully affected all the others and an ejaculation of alarm escaped her as she saw them hastening up to the place occupied by the prostrate trapper before we could arrive on the spot the man had sprung back into an erect attitude and as he stamped his timber leg with violence upon the ground he was heard to exclaim carambo camarados the curs are upon our trail wigalas el perro el perro you hear them the dog the dog the words were scarcely out of his mouth when their interpretation was given in the sound that came pealing up the valley borne upon the sighing breeze it was heard above the rushing noise of the waters easily heard and as easily understood it was the bay of a dog who ran growling along a trail its deep tone was even identified the huntress recognized it in the first note that fell upon her ear as was evidenced by her quick explanation wolf my dog wolf the speech had scarcely escaped her before the dog itself made his appearance convincing us all of his identity the animal seeing us ran no longer by the scent but with raised snout came galloping across the valley and bo and bounded forward to receive the caresses of his mistress we rushed to our weapons and having grasped them ran behind the boulders of rock it would have been idle to have taken to our horses if our pursuers were following the dog and guided by him they would already be near enough to intercept our retreat from the volume perhaps they were at that moment in the gorge we had but one hope and that was that the dog might be alone missing marian at the camp he might have struck upon her trail and been running upon it throughout the night this seemed scarcely probable for holt could have detained him and in all likelihood would have done so still less probable did it appear as we watched the movements of the dog himself instead of staying by marian and continuing to receive her caresses we noticed that at short intervals he ran off again making demonstration in the direction he had come as if in expectation of some one who was following at his heels the slight hope we had conceived was quickly and rudely crushed by the confirmation of this fact the voices of men echoing hoarsely through the gorge confirmed it beyond doubt 
they were our pursuers guided by the dog who little comprehended the danger he was thus conducting toward the object of his instinctive affections End of chapter 104 Chapter 105 of The Wild Huntress This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Wild Huntress by Thomas Maine Reed Chapter 105 An Unexpected Defection almost as soon as we heard the voices we saw those who were giving utterance to them a horseman appeared issuing from the jaws of the chasm another and another until eight had filed into the open ground they were all armed men armed with guns pistols and knives he in the lead was at once identified the colossal stature the green blanket coat red shirt and kerchief turban proclaimed that the foremost of our pursuers was holt himself immediately behind him rode stebbins while those following in the file were the executive myrmidons of the mormon faith the destroying angels on entering the open ground Holt alone kept on without slackening his speed. Stebbins followed, but more cautiously, and at a distance of several length of his horse. The Danites, at sight of our animals, and ourselves too, for they could not fail to see our faces over the rocks, drew up, not suddenly, but one after the other, as if irresolute whether to advance or remain where they were even stebbins though moving on after the squatter did so with evident reluctance he saw the barrels of our rifles gleaming above the boulders and when within about fifty paces of our position he too reined in keeping the body of holt between himself and our guns the squatter continued to advance without the slightest show of fear so near had he got to us that we could note the expression upon his features though it was difficult to understand it it was one that bespoke reckless determination no doubt a determination to recover his child from the savages who had stolen her for as yet he had no reason to think otherwise than that we were indians of course none of us thought of firing upon holt but had stephens at that moment advanced only a step nearer there was more than one rifle ready to give out its deadly detonation holt approached rapidly his horse going a trot he held his long gun obliquely in front of him and grasped in both hands as if ready to fire on the instant all at once he checked his horse dropped the gun on the pommel of his saddle and sat gazing toward us with a look of bewildered surprise white faces appearing over the rock instead of red ones had caused this sudden change in his demeanor before he had time to give utterance to his astonishment lillian glided from behind the boulder and standing with arms extended cried out oh father they are not indians it is marian it is at the same instant her sister appeared by her side marian alive cried holt recognizing his long-lost daughter my child marion yet livin god be praised there's one weight off of my poor soul and now i ease it all another as he uttered the last words he wrenched his horse half around and dropped to his feet upon the nearer side then 
quickly resting his rifle over the hollow of the saddle he brought its barrel to bear on the breast of stebbins who still sat upon horseback scarce twenty paces distant from its muzzle now josh stebbins cried the squatter in a voice of thunder the time's come to square the yards with you what do you mean holt mechanically inquired the mormon in trembling surprise what do you mean by that i mean you infernal skunk that afore you leave this ground you gotta make a clean breast of it and clar me of the crime of murder what murder inquired stebbins prevaricatingly oh you know what i'm talking about twa'n't no murder twere only a suicide and god knows it broke my own heart holt's voice was husky with emotion he continued after a pause for all of that appearances were agin me and you invented proofs that would have stood good among lawyers though they're as false as your own black heart you've kept em over me for years to sarve your rascally designs but there's neither law nor lawyers here to help ye any longer there's witnesses of both sides your own beauties down yonder and some here of a better sort i reckon afore them i call on ye to declare that your proofs were false and that i am innocent of the crime of murder there was a profound silence when the speaker finished the strange and unexpected nature of the demand held every one in breathless surprise even the armed men at the bottom of the vion said not a word and perceiving that by the defection of holt it was almost gun for gun against them they showed no signs of advancing to the protection of their apostolic leader the latter appeared for a moment to vacillate the fear depicted upon his features was blended with an expression of the most vindictive bitterness as that of a tyrant forced to yield up some despotic privilege which he had long wielded true it mattered little to him now the intended victims of his vile contrivance whatever it may have been were likely to escape from his control in another way but for all that he seemed loath to part with even the shadow of his former influence he was not allowed much time for reflection scarce the opportunity to look around upon his danites which however he did glancing back as if desirous of retreating toward them stand your ground shouted the squatter in a tone of menace stand your ground don't dar to turn your face from me if you do you'll only get the bullet in your back now confess or by the eternal god you hain't another second to sit in that saddle the quick threatening matter in which the speaker grasped his gun told stebbins that prevarication would be idle in hurried speech he replied you committed no murder hickman holt i never said you did no but you said you would and you invented proofs of it confess you invented proofs and kept him over my head like a black shatter. Confess that, Stebbins hesitated. Quick, or you're a dead man. I did, muttered the guilty wretch, trembling as he spoke. And the proofs were false. They were false. I confess it. Enough, cried Holt, drawing down his gun. Enough for me. And now, you cowardly snake, you may go with your beauties yander they'll not like you a bit the wuss for all this you may go and carry your conscience along with you if that'll be any comfort to you away with you no exclaimed a voice from behind and at that time wingrove was seen stepping out from the rock not yet exactly 
I've got a score to settle with the skunk. The man who'd plot that way again another hain't ought to live. You may let him off, Hick Holt, but I won't. No, would you either, I reckon, if you knew. Knew what? interrupted the squatter. What he intended for your daughter. He air my daughter's husband, rejoined Holt in a tone that betokened a mixture of bitterness and shame. That was my fault. God forgive me. He ain't your husband. Nothing of the kind. The marriage war a sham. He were taking poor Marion out there for a different purpose, and Lillian too. For what purpose? cried Holt, a new light seeming suddenly to break upon his mind. To make answered wingrove hesitatingly i can't say the word hick holt in present of the girls to make wives to the mormon prophet that's what he intended with both of them the scream that like the neigh of an angry horse burst from the lips of the squatter drowned the last words of wingrove's speech and simultaneously the report of a rifle pealed upon the air. A cloud of smoke for a moment enveloped Holt and his horse, from the midst of which came a repetition of that wild, vengeful cry. At the same instant the steed of Stebbins was seen running riderless down the valley, while the saint himself lay stretched face upward upon the sward. His body remained motionless. He was dead, a purple spot on his forehead showing where the fatal bullet had entered his brain. The sisters had just time to shelter themselves behind the rocks when a volley from the Danites was poured upon us. Their shots fell harmlessly around, while ours, fired in return, had been better aimed and another of these fearful men dropping out of his saddle yielded up his life upon the spot the remaining five seeing that the day had gone against them wheeled suddenly about and galloped back down the gorge ten times faster than they had ridden up it it was the last we saw of the destroying angels oh my children cried holt in a supplicating tone as he staggered forward and received both with his outstretched embrace will ye can ye forgive me oh god i've been a bad father to ye but i knew not the wickedness of those mormon people no nor half of his till it war too late and now and now father said marian interrupting his contrite speech with a consoling smile speak not of forgiveness there is nothing to forgive and perhaps not much to regret since the perils we have gone through have proved our fidelity to one another we shall return home all the happier having escaped from so many dangers dear father Ah marion girl you don't know all we have now no home to go to the same you ever had interposed i if you will consent to accept it the old cabin on mud creek will hold us all till we can build a larger one but no i added correcting myself i see two here who will scarcely feel inclined to share its hospitality another cabin higher up the creek will be likely to claim them for his tenants marian blushed while the young backwoodsman although turning equally red at the illusion had the courage to stammer out that he always thought his cabin war big enough for two stranger said holt turning to me and frankly extending his hand i've much to be ashamed of and much to thank ye for but i accept your kind offer you bought the land and i'd return ye the money if 
hadn't been all spent. I thought I could make up for it by giving you something you might a liked better. Now I see I can't even give you that something, since it appears to be yourn already. You've won her, stranger, and you've got her. All I can now do is to say that from the bottom of my heart I consent to your keeping her. Thanks, thanks, Lillian was mine forever. The curtain falls upon our drama, and brief must be the epilogue. To scenes warlike and savage succeeded those of a pacific and civilized character. As the turbulent torrent, debouching from the mountain channel, flows in tranquil current through the alluvion of the level plain, by our Utah allies, whom we encountered on the following day, we were outfitted for recrossing the prairies. The abandoned wagon, with a team of Indian mules, affording a proper means of transport. Not without regret did we part with the friendly Mexican trapper, and our brave associates, the ex-riflemen and ex-infantry. We had afterwards the gratification to learn that the scalpless man survived his terrible mutilation, that under the protection of Peg Leg, he and Sure Shot were taken to the valley of Taos, whence, along with the next migration of diggers, they proceeded by the Colorado to the Golden Placers of California. To detail the incidents of our homeward journey were a pleasant task for the pen, but the record would scarcely interest the reader. The colossal squatter, silent but cheerful, drove the wagon and busied himself about the management of his mules. The young backwoodsman and I were thus left free to interchange with our respective sweethearts. Those phrases of delicious endearment, those glances of exquisite sweetness, that only pass between eyes illumined by the light of a mutual love. Proverbially sweet is the month after marriage, but the honeymoon, with all its joys, could not have exceeded in bliss those antinuptial hours spent by us in recrossing the prairies. Clear as the sky over our heads was the horoscope of our hearts, all doubt and suspicion had passed away. Not a shadow lingered upon the horizon of our future to dim the perfect happiness we enjoy. In our case, the delight of anticipation could not be enhanced by the actual possession, since we had possession already. We arrived safely in Swampville, in the post office of that interesting village, a letter awaited me, of which jet black was desealed. Under ordinary circumstances, this should have cast a gloom upon my joy, but candor forces me to confess that a perusal of the contents of that epistle produced upon me an effect altogether the reverse. The letter announced the demise of an octogenarian female relative whom i had never seen but who for a full decade of years beyond the period allotted to the life of man or woman either had obstinately persisted in standing betwixt me and a small reversion so long indeed that i had ceased to regard it as an expectation it was of no great amount but arriving just then in the very nick of time was doubly welcome and under its magical influence a large quantity of superfluous timber soon disappeared from the banks of mud creek ah the squatter's clearing with its zigzag fence its girdled trees and white deadwoods it is no longer recognizable the log hut 
is replaced by a pretentious frame dwelling with portico and verandas almost a mansion the little maize patch scarcely an acre in extent is now a splendid plantation of many fields in which wave the golden tassels of the indian corn the broad leaves indigenous vegetable the aromatic indian weed and the gossamer-like florets of the precious cotton plant even the squatter himself you would scarcely recognize in the respectable old gentleman who mounted upon his cob with a long rifle over his shoulder rides around looking after the affairs of the plantation and picking off the squirrels who threaten the young corn with their destructive depredations it is not the only plantation upon mud creek a little further up the stream another is met with almost equally extended and cultivated in like manner need i say who is the owner of this last who should it be but the young backwoodsman now transformed into a prosperous planter the two estates are contiguous and no jealous fence separates the one from the other both extend to that flowery glade of somewhat sad notoriety whose bordering woods are still undefiled by the axe not there but in another spot alike flowerly and pleasant the eye of the soaring eagle looking from aloft might see united together a joyous group the owners of the two plantations with their young wives marion and lillian the sisters are still in the fall bloom of their incomparable beauty in neither is the maiden yet subdued into the matron though each beholds her own type reflected in more than one bright face smiling by her side while more than one little voice lisps sweetly in her ear that word of fond endearment the first that falls from human lips ah beloved lillian thine is not a beauty born to blush but for an hour in my eyes it can never fade but like the blossom of the citron seems only the fairer by the side of its own fruit i leave it to other lips to symbol the praises of thy sister this is the end of chapter one hundred five this is the end of the wild huntress by thomas main reed